navigation and instruments. We recently downloaded the Navionics app on my tablet. It cost about $50 for the app with the Australian and NZ charts on there. I was really disappointed when it didn't work. My tablet didn't have the GPS built in, but after chatting to someone else, they suggested that you could get a freestanding GPS receiver which could connect via Bluetooth to your tablet. So after a bit of internet research, I bought the Garmin Glow, which was about $100. It had a 12-volt charger for the boat and worked really well. You also need the upgrade to the Navionics app to get it to plot routes, but this only cost about $600 from memory. The charts are downloaded when you are in a Wi-Fi zone, so make sure you get those downloaded for the destination before you head off. So I plotted my route on both the paper chart, the tablet, and the handheld GPS. The tablet course displays in true, and of course you will be wanting the compass course to steer. I had already calculated the variation as per the paper chart, but I didn't have a deviation card for my compass sorted. It is easy to sort. As you are sailing along, there is a red line which shows your current course. You line that up with the course line you have plotted, and when they are both together, look at the compass. And this is your compass course to steer for however long your course is. We were motoring as there was no wind, so we didn't have to worry too much about tacking off the track. So we simply steered from the compass, and every 30 mens or so, we checked the table to see that we were still on the course we wanted and made any adjustments as necessary. We were way offshore most of the time, so it wasn't until we came through a channel where we had to navigate around the rocks to get through the channel that I became concerned about the accuracy of it. However, I wasn't disappointed. We were able to navigate around the rocks, and by taking some bearings as we went along, it was apparent that our position on the tablet was exactly where we were in the ocean. I also loved that we could add our own comments onto the chart, so you can add good anchorages, moorings, fishing spots, unmarked hazards, marina details, walking tracks, onshore facilities, photos, etc., which are all shared with other Navionics users. You can also share your route and course on Facebook or to your website if you have an internet connection on your tablet. I hooked mine up to my phone to do that. I also had a backup GPS handheld chart plotter, but the screen on this was so much smaller than the tablet, and it was slow to update the picture. I only bought it about five years ago, and it makes you realize how far technology has come in this area in such a short time. So in short, I give the Navionics app on my tablet is a big thumbs up and would highly recommend it to others. New chart plotters can display AIS, weather, radar, and the chart plotter chart all on one screen now. I will do some more research into those options. Here is what we will need as a minimum as per the Yachting NZ Cat 1 regulations. 1. Compass and deviation card. 2. Spare compass or hand bearing. 3. Depth sounder. 4. Log speedo. I find the one on my boat gets bunged up so quickly with slime that it never works anyway and I hate taking it out to clean it. The water comes in so fast. 5. Wind instruments. I don't have these, and not too bothered if we don't have them on the new yacht as I think I am quite good at reading the wind by the state of the waves, etc. 6. Handheld GPS chart plotter, a standalone unit that runs on batteries as a backup in case you lose all electronics. 7. The tablet with Navionics app costs about $50 for the app. 8. Garmin Glow, standalone GPS receiver for the iPad. Garmin Glow for aviation. 9. Yacht GPS Chart Plotter 10. AIS It looks like an AIS receiver is relatively easy to install with your VHF radio. 11. Charts for the area 12. Cruising Guide for the area and tide tables 13. Sextant and tables 14. Radar is recommended 15. Barometer 16. Radar Reflector 17. Navigation Lights and Emergency Navigation Lights 18. Binoculars 19. Foghorn a few other people recommended OpenCPN as another chart plotter option instead of Navionics. I've downloaded it to my computer and will have a play to see what I think. We also downloaded an app called Marine Traffic, which was supposed to show us all the commercial shipping going past. It looked fantastic, but in reality, it was useless. I am sure once the technology gets better, this might be a useful thing to have on your phone, but it was in no way accurate on our coastal trip. GPS... I have used a handheld GPS chart plotter which I have had for about five years. It is amazing how far technology has come in that short time, as I also have Navionics installed on my tablet, which is of course a much bigger screen, and loads a lot faster than the handheld GPS. Anyway, I knew that GPS has some amazing capabilities and so I wanted to learn how to use my GPS more effectively and also get a better understanding as to how the whole thing works. 
Here are some of the things that I learned from the Coast Guard Boating Education GPS Operator course. GPS was developed in the 1970s and testing began in the 1980s. There were two channels, one encrypted for military use and the other degraded for civilian use. This was known as selective availability. In May 2000, this was set to zero, which improved the accuracy from around 100 to 20 on million. The facility for them to reinstall selective availability still exists. How does GPS work? There are a series of satellites, between 24 and 31, about 20,000 km above the Earth. These are arranged in six different orbits and are inclined 55 degrees to one another. Each satellite transmits an individual time signal and information on its position, an almanac which predicts where the satellites are in space. They broadcast on individual microwave frequencies, which travel at 300,000 thousand meters per second. The GPS have two atomic clocks installed. The GPS receiver knows the position of the satellite from its almanac, which contains the predicted positions in space of all the satellites by recording the time it received the signal, and hence the time it took to travel, it can work out the distance to the satellite. This results in a position circle. At any point on that circle, the distance time from the satellite is equal. To get a reliable fix, you need at least three satellites. The position in which all three circles overlap gives you your position. The GPS receiver on your boat has only a digital clock, which is not as reliable as the atomic clock on the satellite. Anytime errors can cause huge errors in your position. To get around this, your receiver uses pseudo-ranging, which is a series of calculations of adding or subtracting a certain amount of time to get the position circles to all intersect. A satellite is considered to be in view when it is at least 7.5 degrees above the horizon. Anything under this suffers from distortion due to refraction as it passes through the atmosphere at a shallow angle. Generally, at any one time, there will be at least six satellites above the horizon, and at least four of these will be greater than 9.5 degrees above the horizon. To get a longitude and latitude fix, you need at least three satellites. If you want 3D, i.e. E, your height as well, then you need four satellites. Most GPS units will have an alarm to tell you if it can't find enough satellites to get a proper fix. When you first turn on your GPS, or if it has been switched off for some time, it will need to update its almanac with any correction signals, and it can take some time to do this. GPS units usually have the following options. Choice of language. Units of measurement, meters or feet. Units of distance speed, miles, nautical miles or km. Bearings, in true or magnetic. Coordinates, Latin long. Time, UTC or local time. Survey datum, WGS 84. The GPS display will usually give your position in latitude and longitude in degrees, minutes, and three decimal places of a minute. However, the accuracy is probably not that great. The common level of accuracy is about 20 meters from your actual position. The reason for any inaccuracy can be as follows. 1. Refraction of signal. Issues with the radio waves transmitting through the atmosphere. 5. 12 meters. Clock error. 2 mm. Any inaccuracy with your GPS clock. Thought satellite position error. 4M, any discrepancy from its actual versus its stated position in the almanac. 4. Multipath error, 13 mare, signal reflected by your own vessel or other objects. High cliffs or marinas can cause the signal to bounce. 5. Satellite masking, variable, high cliffs or buildings can block the satellite signals. 6. Poor satellite geometry, variable if the satellites are too close together. HDOP, horizontal dilution of precision. GDOP, geometric dilution of position, EPE, estimated position of error. The greater value of these means the greater error of GPS positions. So when HDOP is 1, the geometry is closer to ideal. Anything greater than 5 will result in unreliable fixes. You can check this number on the satellite page of the GPS. This page also shows how many satellites are visible, how many are being used, and the theoretical fix accuracy. So, in other words, you don't want to rely on your GPS being 100% accurate all the time, particularly when navigating close to dangerous objects. There are a few things to remember when you are sighting your GPS antenna. 1. It needs an uninterrupted view of the sky. 2. It should be positioned as low as possible. The higher up it is, the more inaccurate it will be when pitching or rolling. 3. Take care when putting it near other electrical equipment. Glossary. WPT. Waypoint a position stored for navigational purposes, DIST, distance or range to waypoint, DTD, distance to destination, BRG, bearing, true or magnetic, 
a bearing from present position to next waypoint. DTW, distance to waypoint. COG, course over ground, an average over a pre-selected time. CMG, course made good, an average from point of departure to current position. SOG, speed over ground, how fast you are going over the ground. SMG, speed made good, average from point of departure to present position. VMG, velocity made good, closing speed to waypoint. ETA, estimated time of arrival. TTG, time to go to waypoint. STE, cross track error, the perpendicular distance of the vessel from the course line. You can set an alarm to make sure you don't go too far off course. CTS, course to steer. Velocity smoothing. Some units give you the option to average the SOG and COG over a selected time. Use with caution if operating at high speeds. Waypoints are a position that can be entered into your GPS. It can give you the course and distance between waypoints. You can link them together to form a route. You can name the waypoints and routes. You can tap to add them, enter them in when you are underway, or enter the coordinates of lat and long. MOB, a man overboard button, enters an active waypoint from the vessel's present position. If you are on a route, the GPS will realize the waypoint once you are a beam, and it will then calculate the track to the next waypoint. Issues with GPS, human error, entering the wrong waypoints, forming a route without checking for hazards on the track, entering the exact position of a buoy, beacon, or headland as the waypoint. You might hit it, not noticing that you have drifted off course and that possible danger now lays between you and your next waypoint. An assumption that the chart and GPS is 100% accurate. Electronic charts not updated. Alarms. Most GPS units have got an anchor watch function which will sound an alarm if you drift too far from a set position. There is also arrival at waypoint alarms, distance to waypoint alarm, and a XTE alarm. If you go too far off your intended course. Chart plotters. Chart plotters use two types of charts, raster and vector. A raster chart is a scanned copy of an existing paper chart. They are cheap to make but take up lots of memory space. They look exactly the same as paper charts and contain the same information. When you zoom in, you are effectively looking through a magnifying glass. They are quality assured as they are copies of existing charts. A vector chart is layers of digital information stored in a database. They use less memory, but they need more processing power. Vector charts can be zoomed in or out to a far greater extent with the symbols remaining the same size on the screen. The display can be customized to hide light characteristics during the day or removing depth sounding figures over a certain depth. Certain features can be interrogated with the cursor to give lots more detail. To be reliable, electronic charts must be maintained and kept updated. Vector charts can be corrected online or sometimes via a new memory card. Raster charts are a bit more complicated with a new tile of information needing to be pasted into the program. There are different modes. You can have the screen set to head up, course up, or north up. One, head up. The top of the screen is displayed so that the top of the screen corresponds with the vessel's direction. This means that the corresponding view is the same orientation as the navigator's view. The disadvantage to this is that any alterations will require the chart to be redrawn. This can cause disorientation. Two course up, the chart is displayed so that the top of the screen is aligned with the active route. The chart is only redrawn when the vessel changed course more than a certain angle, so virtually the same orientation as the navigator's view. 3. North up. The chart is displayed so that the top of the screen is north and the bottom is south, true or magnetic. The advantage of this is that it is the same as the paper chart. The disadvantage is that when the boat is heading south, it can be a little confusing figuring out which way to turn the helm to correspond with the GPS. 4. Relative motion. The vessel stays in the center of the screen and the chart moves past the vessel. You can offset the position of the vessel so it shows more ahead than behind the track. 5. True motion. The chart remains stationary and the vessel moves over the screen. When it reaches the end, then the chart is redrawn. 6. You can split the screen to show extra information. The chart plus the course, speed, radar, etc. 7. You can set a range ring around your vessel to easily show how far charted objects are from the screen. Route planning tips. 1. Look at the route as a whole and identify any hazards. 2. Decide on a safe distance from the hazards and any turning points. 3. Plot the intended route on the chart screen using the cursor. 4. Cross-check with paper charts to ensure the safe distances are okay. 5. Note the minimum XTE on individual legs.
6. Document your route, waypoints, distances, and course to steer on your passage plan. While underway, 1. Monitor your position constantly with the GPS and by using your eyes. 2. Depth soundings, light sectors, and radar ranges can be used to confirm your position with what the GPS is saying. 3. Monitor your XTE. 4. Monitor your time, speed, slash distance. 5. Document in your log. Always check the survey datum of the paper chart. The standard datum is WGS84. There are lots of charts in use which were surveyed before GPS came along. All NZ charts are set to WGS84. If the chart has been surveyed to a different datum, then you need to make adjustments. Remember that GPS units can fail. Perhaps a lightning storm might take out all your electronics or the satellites can be affected by meteors, wars, or solar storms. So it is a good idea to also have a backup, a main GPS on the boat, a handheld chart plotter, and perhaps a tablet with Navionics too. Also, paper charts are like me. You can do a celestial navigation course. So that is about it. The best way to learn, I think, is to use your GPS to plot a route. Add a few waypoints and go out and use it. Happy navigating, radar, while studying the Ocean Yacht Master Certificate. The syllabus requires that we learn about all sorts of different aspects of navigation, safety, boat handling, and much more. So this video is about all I need to know about radar. For the Ocean Yacht Master Certification, you need to have a general understanding of the following things. 1. Principles of radar. 2. Components of a radar set. 3. Controls. 4. Displays. 5. Discrimination. 6. Targets. And radar navigation. 8. Collision avoidance. Radar stands for Radio Detection and Ranging Radar was primarily used for the detection of other vessels and collision avoidance. And as the technology advanced, it became valuable for navigation and fixing positions. Radar operates on an echo principle. A stream of radio energy pulses is transmitted in a narrow beam from a highly directional aerial called a scanner. These pulses may be reflected from objects in the path of the beam, called targets, and returned to the scanner as echoes. The speed of travel of the pulses is 300 million meters per second. By timing the interval between transmission and reception of each pulse, the radar can determine the range of the target using the time-speed-distance formula. Echoes are displayed on a screen, sometimes called a Plan Position Indicator, PPI. Your own vessel is in the middle of the display and targets around the vessel are displayed in plan form so that their bearing and range can be determined. Radars can be interfaced with other navigational instruments, for example, the compass and GPS receiver. The information from these other instruments can be incorporated into the radar display. You can adjust the range scale to different distances. There is also a heading line indicating the direction in which the vessel is heading. If linked to a compass, it can also show the compass heading of the vessel. You can select north up or head up display options. The vessel remains stationary in the display and the targets move past the vessel, relative motion. Advantages. Radar can detect targets which may not be visible to the eye, making it useful for the detection of targets including boats and the coastline in poor visibility and at night. Limitations. Many weather conditions, including fog, heavy seas, and rain, can affect its operation and efficient detection of targets. Radar views the coastline from a sea-level perspective, not a bird's-eye view, so the coastline may appear different to what the chart shows. This can make identification of areas difficult. Smaller scanners on small boats limit the accuracy of the bearings, and this can mean they have limited navigational use. Radar can only correctly reproduce the nearest side of the coastline at sea level, never points inland or up high. Poor targets such as low-lying land or wooden and fiberglass boats do not reflect the radar signal very effectively and therefore might not show up. Conical shapes also don't produce a good echo. It can also not see over its horizon. Navigation. Radar can be used to either obtain bearings from your position or distances off-range or a certain target. If the radar is linked to a compass, then the bearing of an object will be a compass bearing and can be utilized accordingly. If it is not linked to a compass, then the bearing is relative to the head of the vessel and needs to be converted into a compass course before it can be plotted on a chart. Most radars on small boats are not stabilized with a compass. A properly calibrated radar can accurately measure the distance from any object visible as a target. Radar range can be read from the display by means of fixed range rings or calibration rings or a variable range marker, VRM, or as a cross-shaped cursor which can be moved around the display. 
Make sure you positively identify the target that the radar is using with that on your chart. You can then set your drawing compass to the same charted distance in nautical miles as the measured radar range and plot a position circle on your chart. Combine this with a bearing and you have a position fix. Collision avoidance. If the bearing of a ship remains the same on your radar screen over a period of time, then there is a risk of collision. Clutter. Clutter, also termed ground clutter, is a form of radar signal contamination. It occurs when fixed objects close to the transmitter, such as buildings, trees, or terrain, hills, ocean swells, and waves, obstruct a radar beam and produce echoes. The echoes resulting from ground clutter may be large in both size and intensity. The effects of ground clutter fall off as range increases, usually due to the curvature of the Earth and the tilt of the antenna above the horizon. Without special processing techniques, targets can be lost in returns from terrain on land or waves at sea. Clutter is used by the military to jam radars by the use of chaff. Chaff is small reflective material used to hide troop, ship, or aircraft movements by creating many returns and overwhelming the radar's receiver with spurious targets. More clutter will usually appear on the screen upwind. Discrimination. Discrimination, that is the capacity of the radar to distinguish between two targets fairly close together. CPA, closest point of approach, and TCPA, time to closest point of approach. Jackie made a comment below about CPA and TCPA. This is a method of working out how close a target is going to get to your course and how long it is going to take. Parallel indexing. Another thing that Jackie mentions in her comment is parallel indexing. This technique involves creating a line on the screen that is parallel to the ship's course, but offset to the left or right by some distance. This parallel line allows the navigator to maintain a given distance away from hazards. Thanks for those tips, Jackie. Sounds like some more useful things to know. Cruising World has some great tips about radar usage, new types of radars available, their limitations and where to mount them. So, do you have radar on your cruising boat? Do you enjoy using it? I don't currently have radar, so I would love to know.